Okay, so this morning I was talking about sort of the past and how it carries uh, up to now. Um, and most of the things I was talking about were facts because, well, we're past the end time. Uh, this stuff is work that's current and it points to things that needs to be done in, in the future. And it uh, tries to encourage uh, people to take part and help. So um, not all the little corners are polished, but I think this is, this is important kind of stuff. Um, the idea of C um, and uh, C++ is um, strong static type checking. And as Dennis pointed out, uh, we're not quite, we were not quite there with C and we're not quite there with C++. Um, and uh, th there are a set of rules that make sure everything's fine, it's just we can't um, follow them at scale. And so to write good code in C or C++, we have to follow some rules and um, we have to for guarantee, we have to look for analysis from the compiler for static analyzers, and we need support for libraries for doing messy things that are not that easy to prove. The basic ideas of what I am talking about uh, can be found in a paper I wrote some years ago um, that goes through that. And um, there is a sort of serious constraint about what uh, I and others are doing is that we don't want to imply a restriction of the domain that we can use uh, C++ for uh, while being completely uh, type and resource safe and we do not want to pay in runtime. It's still C++, it, it is not some uh, strange uh, limited language. And, and basically the rules are very simple they've been around forever. Every object is accessed according to the type with which it was defined. Every object is constructed and properly destroyed. Every pointer either points to a valid object or is a null pointer. Every reference to a pointer that is not through the null, uh, every reference to a pointer is, is not through the null pointer. We have to make sure we check. And every access through a subscripted pointer is in range. So if we can do that, we actually have safety. That's what the language requires, and that's what I claim uh, we are getting close to uh, being. Okay, so uh, first of all, a safety and security is not the same as type safety. I can write a really lousy type safe program um, that uh, basically makes every mistake um, for the system that you can. So it's not enough to be type safe. Uh, I like to point that out because some people think, uh, talk as if, if you could remove all the type safety problems, there wouldn't be any problems left. Um, and also the type system has weaknesses like the mixtures of unsigned and signed, so you can follow all the rules and it's still lousy. So what's legal is not the same as what we want as safe, reasonable, efficient, maintainable. And type and resource safety should be the default everywhere. I am very keen on the idea of gradual introduction of ideas and that different domains have different criteria for what they consider safe, reasonable, maintainable and such. But it would be really nice if we could have the default being complete type and resource safety. So I'm talking about resource safety, I'm talking about type safety, I am not talking about security. Um, so what we have been doing here for some years, uh, a group of us, um, the C++ core guidelines, and uh, you can find them on, on the web, they're a good, um, good set of rules to look at, see which ones you can use for your application, and um, see which ones can be checked. Uh, there are quite a few checkers around now. Uh, some of them are getting uh, reasonably close to what I'm talking about 
none can do everything what I'm talking about, but I am encouraging people to check better and for people to use it better. Okay, what is not covered here is uh, all of these other kinds of bugs you can have. Uh, I'm particular um, annoyed by the things you can do with mixing signed and unsigned. Uh, there are checkers for that, but that's just not what I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about the concurrency uh, issues except for one slide. There's another talk about that in this conference, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not talking about performance bugs. Again, you can write a program that is perfectly correct, but will not finish in any reasonable time for any reasonable deadline. We, we have to keep our eye out on those things. We cannot create safety rules that stops the language from being used in the domain in which it is being used and where we would like it to be used. Okay, so fundamental ideas here. Uh, express the, uh, ideas directly in code. If we tell the compiler uh, what we are trying to do, it has a chance of uh, checking it, has a chance to optimize it, uh, people who read the code has a chance to understand it. Don't waste time and space. This is C++ after all. And the world is messy, so there will be messy code somewhere encapsulated uh, rather than spreading it throughout the code through interfaces that all have all kinds of problems to slip through. These are the core guidelines. There's uh, 11 or 12 uh, philosophical principles that cannot be checked by compilers because, well, they're com philosophical, but they are uh, quite uh, useful to, to look at. And uh, when you do static analysis, to scale, the static analysis has to be local. We can't just say, go and run a static analysis on your whole program um, and make sure there's no problems. Oh yeah, uh, and by the way, we have uh, dynamically linked libraries and well, etc. So we can't do that. It has to be local. And sync similarly, uh, there has to be few positives, uh, po false positives. If we design a system that has a lot of false positives, it will not be used. And so th those are our ground rules for this. So the static analysis, yeah, as I said, it has to scale um, and uh, sometimes you can prove things are safe, sometimes you can prove things are not safe, and sometimes you're not sure. The core guidelines being guidelines as opposed to guarantees uh, sometimes isn't sure and we don't check. For guarantees, we have to reject things that we cannot be sure is right. Um, I, I call that call a human. That is, uh, is it good, is it bad, or call a human to uh, try and uh, figure it out. Sometimes that means simplify the code. You have to help the static analyzer, and I find that when you help the static analyzer, you very often help human readers too. Um, it's the same information, and there's a, a talk by Sonny Chattery about uh, static analysis of this kind of stuff. And so let's look at some of the rules. Always initialize an object. I mean, if we have uninitialized objects lying around, all kinds of bad things can happen. Uh, undefined behavior is very easy to create. Just uninitialize, have something uninitialized and use it. That's usually bad. And so uh, we have to um, ban unsafe use of unions. We can use variants. Um, casting has to be limited extremely and unsafe, uh, and that is easier done with uh, now with the templates and things like that. And unsafe uses of pointers has to be stopped. We have to um, stop scope scripting of uh, arrays where we, of pointers where we don't know the size, and there's alternatives, variant, span, and things like that. And so here's, here's an example, uh, an integer y. I may or may not assign to the integer y, and then I return it. This leaves an uninitialized object around. That is no good. Um, if you think uninitialized integers are uh, sort of moderately harmless, 
you could pick any other type for, for this that it isn't guaranteed to be initialized. That's not okay. We could be clever. We could do a, a analysis of uh, the use of uh, the uninitialized variable to see that we didn't get into trouble, but for the core guidelines, we're trying to simplify code. We like uh, we, we like to see if users can actually read the stuff, so we do it. Uh, there are is things like buffers that has to be dealt with. Um, they can be uh, done in terms of uh, standard byte these days, and that's what we use for uninitialized stuff. But but note that we can't just make a, a, a random strong guarantee that bans the use of uh, C++ in, uh, say, networking uh, by, by insisting everything should be initialized, thereby doubling the cost of uh, I.O. operations, some I.O. operations. Okay, every object is properly constructed and destroyed. That's what's needed for uh, resource management. Every resource, meaning something that has to be uh, hand it back to some other part of the system, has to be handled by a resource handle, that's RAII, that's uh, going back to the earliest days of, the, uh, of um, the language, and this is actually not too hard to achieve, so this is good. And it's not, 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 by the way, not just that you don't leak the resources, you also need not to retain them for too long. One of the easiest ways of slowing down a program is to hold on to objects for twice as long. Um, then you need either a twice as big computer or twice as much time. Um, so we, we have to control that. So every pointer should either point to an object or be the null pointer. We can't have uh, dangling pointers. And when I say pointer, I mean anything that points to an object. So this simply has to disappear, no dangling pointers. And uh, here's a simple example of the uh, problem. Down there in G, I make a uh, object, I pass it to F and I use it. In isolation, this looks very reasonable and nice, except up in, e up in F, I delete that P, meaning that the use down in G is to a deleted object. That is no good. If we're lucky, it crashes. If it's not lucky, uh, we may scramble something else and strange things might happen. Uh, this is my picture I found on the web of a nightmare, and this is a nightmare scenario. So it cannot be uh, okay to delete something you don't know if you own, and it cannot be uh, okay uh, not to have a resource handle. So um, we must eliminate them, otherwise everything is, com uh, uh, is uh, compromised. We do that partly by using resource handles. Resource handles are things like uh, vectors and smart pointers and threads, anything that, that holds something but knows how to destruct it. And if we want to do that at lower levels, um, like in the implementation of Vector, we have an annotation in the core guidelines called Owner that alerts the, um, the, the static analyzer that this is an owner, and I'll show you how to use those. And by the way, not all resources are memory, and not even all memory comes out of new. Don't forget malloc and its uh, friends Okay, so, and again, you have to catch pointers trying to escape uh, all kinds of uh, things that refers to object, just not just T stars. So a pointer value can be returned from a scope if it was passed into the scope. So we have a world where pointers are valid. Therefore, if I got a pointer from you, it's valid. And uh, I have to make sure if I give you a pointer, it's valid. And so uh, if it's passed into the scope, it's fine. If it's retrieved from an external object, that's fine. And if it points to an object external to the scope, it's also fine. If your static analyzer cannot prove that, the pointer cannot be returned. This is a local thing. It's a per scope rule. Uh, current Static analyzers are actually pretty good at this. Okay, so 
there, there's an example. Um, I make a pointer to a dynamic piece of storage, uh, free store. I assign it to another, delete the original, and then use the copy. It's not okay, but static and local static analysis can catch that. Um, escaping pointers, we look at the pointers, how were the pointers created, and uh, can I return it from the scope and a local pointer we can't, and that's, that, that's about it. Remember, when I'm saying return, I mean any way of getting that value out of the scope. Um, I, I once tried to trick, trick um, one of the, actually it is several years ago, I tried to track, uh, to trick the static analyzer that's being shipped with Visual Studio by implicitly grabbing a local variable, putting it into a lambda and returning that lambda, I thought, at least I can fool them like that. I could not. So uh, any way of getting things out of the scope. This is a lot of work, but it's being done. Don't dereferencing an invalid pointer, and you can make it a dereference, not dereferencing, dereferenceable in several ways, uninitialized, but we stop uninitialized values to exist, dangling pointers, but we stop them from dangling, and invalidation, retain a pointer, delete or relocate the, uh, the resource, and uh, that can be the problem. We can be in the null pointer, or we can be one past the end of a sequence. So let's look at that. Ownership is something, an owner is something that's responsible for invoking a destructor. And it can be a scope, it can be an object, and something holds an owner is an owner. Notice all of these rules are recursive. Um, it's not just the surface area we are looking at, we're looking at, at down there. So ownership in uh, the core guidelines uh, support library, very little library, is simply a, um, a, a, an annotation owner of T is a T, as far as the compiler is concerned, on, unless it understands owners, but it means that the static analyzer can know this. And so uh, we use these annotations for, for things that comes from new, and uh, the, the rule is that if you are an owner, you must delete that object. If you are not an owner, you must not delete that object, and that can be checked. If you want to give an owner to somebody else, well, you must give it as an owner, and now you no longer can delete the object, but the other guy has to. It's fairly reasonable rules. Um, there, uh, we're back to my nightmare example. I'm trying to delete PP and F. PP isn't an owner. Uh, sorry, F isn't an owner, therefore it cannot be uh, done. And similarly, uh, down at the um, use example, the uh, new integer is assigned to a non-owner, so it doesn't have an owner, but then you have leaked it, that's not allowed, so that gets caught. So it, it, it works. Uh, you can add ownership to it, to handling. Now, F is an owner, therefore it must delete and uh, down in, um, in, in use. If I tried to delete, that would be caught as an error because, well, I'm handing the ownership over to somebody else. Uh, this gets messy. Anything that involves a lot of annotations and careful attention across scopes and things like that is error prone. And therefore, if we forced people to write a lot of annotations, they would make mistakes. And it would be you can catch them with the static analyzers, but that becomes messy too. So the strong recommendation is prefer ownership abstractions that actually reflect something in the domain um, instead of being a low level uh, annotation. Vectors own their elements, maps those two unique pointers, file streams owns uh, stream, uh, file handles and buffers, uh, threads owns um, handles, uh, thread handles, and, and other stuff, right? So the owner annotation is for implementation of ownership and to avoid ABI break. Sometimes we have to call code that doesn't obey our rules. 
and so um, we and we can't rewrite them so we can't say change the code that takes a pointer and an integer to taking a span which would be the the, the good uh, and proper way to do it so sometimes we have to to deal with this kind of stuff here's the uh, sketch of a vector implementation it has three pointers one of them is the owner that keeps the object, uh, the, the elements alive, and two are just pointers. Remember now, with all of these guarantees in place, pointers are, are, are very good at pointing at things. They, they, that's what pointers are good at. They're just machine addresses, no overhead, no uh, complication. So there's two of those to point into the data that is kept alive by the owner, the LM there. Um, invalidation, uh, it comes, an operation may reallocate elements and so that uh, we now don't point to what it was before. Uh, there's an example with pointers to pointers. I uh, intensely dislike pointers to pointers, by the way. Um, I think there should be an ownership abstraction that says what that pointer that's pointed to really represent. Uh, and you can do that. But anyway, container is anything that holds a pointer. So uh, here's a classical invalidation example. Um, I have a vector. I grab a pointer to an element in it. And uh, then I call a function and I use that pointer. Unfortunately, the function uh, now you does a pushback, which may or may not reallocate all the elements. So that pointer down there in G uh, may or may not point at something meaningful when you get to uh, assign through it. So that is not okay. The static analyzer catches it. Uh, it's another one of these examples. I tried to see if I could break it and failed. And that's very good. This kind of stuff um, can be caught today. And basically, the, the rule for invalidation is if you call a function that is non-const, or if you pass the pointer as, as non-const to a function, then we must assume statically that the um, that, that, that what the pointer to is invalidated. And uh, that is a conservative thing. I, I think we probably need to do something more because notice that a, a vector swap and a, a vector operator subscript uh, are not const functions, but they don't invalidate. And so I am uh, dreaming of something that you can annotate with saying this function is non-validating. This is an interesting um, annotation because it can be verified by the static analyzer. So in principle, the static analyzer could look at every function and see if they invalidate it. So it's not necessary. But to get moving, maybe this is the right thing to do. We'll be discussing this in the, um, in, in the core guidelines uh, context. And uh, I, I, I'm proposing don't use pointers to pointers or references to pointers as a rule too. But of course, we can't have such a rule unless we've done some homework to see uh, how much code it breaks because we don't want to violate the rule that we don't want a lot of false positives. So these are just proposals. Uh, if you have input to that, please please bring, the for bring it forward to the core guidelines. There's a GitHub, you can put note on things there. Um, the other thing is that we have to remember that one of the things C++ is used for a lot is to create special kinds of memories, different memory pools. Um, New and delete creates a memory pool, uh, but so does malloc and free. And um, in, in some sense, you could consider a vector, a memory pool, and we, we certainly have memory pools. So we have to handle all kinds of separately managed memory. Anything where you, where, where you uh, allocate and free is, is a memory pool like this. We don't have an abstraction for a memory pool in C++, and that's sad because then you can't just have all static analyzers uh, look at that memory pool and only those. As it is, 
we, we have to have have to look at everything that is a memory pool, even though the abstraction is, is not explicit, so that we actually have to program it into some of the analyzers. That's a pain in the neck, and but it's one of the reasons for thinking about having the non-invalidating uh, things so that we can just look at the pointers and the functions uh, should not be uh, validating. Uh, one example that, that I worry about ever so often is, uh, is tree, is graphs. And uh, here's a, a tree for a small example here. We have um, a tree node, a tree consists of three nodes, and we have done them with unique pointers so it looks uh, really quite nice. The problem is you can make a loop. And if you want to guarantee safety, you basically have to reject um, examples like that based on the types. Uh, this is static guarantees we would like, and we can do that. That's not uh, at all hard. Uh, you simply look to see uh, whether the uh, whether you can create a loop, um, and you could solve this kind of stuff. Uh, you have the tree here, and it separates pointing into the tree to the nodes and the ownership of it. So a vector of unique pointers has the owners. Uh, the tree nodes just are ordinary pointers, so they are maximally flexible, maximally uh, general. And uh, when you are finished with this tree, uh, we don't use those pointers that go across in the data structures for anything in the, in the destruction. In the deletion, we just use the, the tree. So one way of dealing with these memory pools when you want to build them yourself is simply separate um, ownership from pointing. And notice that a lot of trees to be able to manage ownership and, and references use two-way references. And if you separate them, you, you get at most two pointers per uh, object. So in a, in a lot of cases, this work. I'm not going to claim that it also always works, but it works for a large class of uh, problems. And you can then provide guarantees for anything that fits into this. Uh, some one-time checks are unavoidable uh, because it depends on values not known until uh, runtime. Uh, there can be null pointers. Uh, in GSL, there's a, a little uh, abstraction called not null. And range errors, where we recommend to use GSL span, which has, uh, in a slightly modified form, come into the standard library. By the way, when I say GSL, the guideline standard library, this is a library we would like to put out of business. It has about a dozen very small abstractions currently. And it would be really nice if we could get rid of that library. It's logically redundant. It should be in the standard. And we have to deal with one past the end pointers, which are nasty things. Um, so here's a, a, a range check. There's some rules for it in the standard, in, in, um, <laughs> in the core guidelines. Um, only point, a pointer points to one element. If you want to point to lots of elements, you have to do something else. You can use a pointer abstraction, like uh, ownership abstraction like vector, or you can use a span, which means that if you get a pointer and you subscript it, it's not okay, it's kicked out by the static analyzer. Uh, there went just about all of your C++ programs. On the other hand, it is not that difficult to change int star p, where you usually have comma int n to tell how many elements there are, into span of int. And um, it, it, you, I, I'm dreaming of things where you would actually be ABI compatible uh, when you're doing that change. But anyway, it's not okay to subscript, subscript the pointer. It is uh, okay to subscript the span, the fat pointer. And once we have created the abstraction of a non-owning reference to an array, which is what a span is, you can now use that fact. You can run um, range fours without any range checking because span uh, holds the right uh, number of elements. Bingo. 
Okay, uh, null pointer problems. I couldn't resist using an example to show that this is not just a C and C++ program. But basically, the fundamental thing is, if you have a pointer, you don't actually know whether it is supposed to be able to be the null pointer or not. So you can get either too few or too many tests. And uh, either way is bad. Too few, you crash or get bad results. Too many, you slow down. Um, so uh, here we can have a not null. And here up in F, I'm taking a, a pointer as a not null. And um, I'm testing. That's redundant. The compiler can, can, can tell, sorry, the static analyzer can tell us that you have done a redundant check. Where you use it, um, I, uh, it's calling a non-null. So uh, I'm calling it with null pointer. That's obviously not okay. I'm calling it with a pointer that we don't know if it's not null. That's not okay either. If we test, it is okay, meaning that we have to have the flow control in the um, in the static analysis, obviously we do, both for, for ownership, for, for range checking, um, and, and, and for invalidation, uh, flow control is necessary. It's, just, it not, it's not just type analysis. Uh, okay, one past the endpointers uh, gives me a, a nightmare because, well, how do I know whether it's a one pass the end pointer. And um, I, I'm going to look carefully and probably suggest that there be a designated name in, G in GSL called not end, so that we can, it, given two things, um, a, point, a pointer, an iterator, and a container, and it'll test against the end in that uh, pointer, in that container. And uh, th this is generalizes not just for standard library things, but so we can, we can test. Because in the C and C++ memory model, you can point to the, uh, one plus, uh, to, to the um, last plus one element. You can form that uh, pointer. Whether the legality says so or not, you can in many situations. And so we should be able to test for it and guarantee that these tests are done. And low-level code, um, we can't just make uh, the language safe by removing all low-level code. And so currently, we can't test everything. The tools are not up to it. So what is done is it's selective use of static analysis. There's something called pro profiles in the uh, Microsoft uh, static checker that says, OK, today we check for range errors, because that's what we can do for this code base. And somewhere else we might test for, for uh, ownership. Um, getting everything put together is the ideal, and running all the tests, but that takes time, gradual introduction, improvements of, uh, of coding style and such is necessary. And I am suggesting, unimplemented, that we should be able to annotate Necessary, uh, messy code with being trusted. Every system that deals with um, really messy code tend to have some way of saying, this code is so messy that we need the humans to look at it and, and, and certify it. That kind of facility is always overused. So if we get it, there's a guarantee you it'll be overused. Any sloppy programmer will just slap a tr trusted on the code and um, we will, our systems will crash. On the other hand, a, a tested, a, a static analyzer can look for trusted and call for a code review. So uh, the, it'll be an indicator. Basically, maybe it shouldn't be called trusted. It should be called messy. Uh, ba basically, uh, the, the, the idea is it calls attention to where our mechanical tools come to an end. Um, concurrency is a, a big issue. I said I wouldn't say much about it, but the core guidelines does uh, provide a few uh, rules. Use RAII, uh, use a scope locked when you can for acquire multiple uh, locks. 
uh, never caught unknown code by holding a code. These are, to the best of my knowledge, not tested, checked very well currently. They are checkable. And um, there's a talk by Mike Wong uh, today, may actually be overlapping with this, that you can uh, see work being done for extending uh, the core guidelines to concurrency issues uh, done under the guise of MISRA. So uh, something good might come out of this. And so why am I not saying we'll build that into the language, make the language safe? And the answer is stability, compatibility. We have a few billion lines of code that we care about. Different domains have different notions of safety. If we build one into the language, we are likely to end up with compromising something and we're likely to be really annoying somebody else because it's not their notion of safety. Like, should we kick out all mixed, signed, unsigned um, um, expressions? I would love to, but notice the standard library uses unsigned in places that makes that hard to do. So um, I think we need to have it not as a language rule, but as a guideline rule. And also gradual adoption is essential. And it would be really nice if we had a if we had plan platform independent static analyzers. I should have used uh, the plural there. I'm a great fan of having more than one version of something like compiling things with two compilers uh, gives us an extra guarantee using two static analyzers, well, there's a better chance. And I would like to see uniform adoption of the basic type and resource safety rules, uh, the ones I've mostly talked about today. Uh, I think that is a feasible thing uh, when we think a couple of years out in the future, but we have to work on it. It doesn't uh, do itself. And uh, why am I doing for uh, core guidelines? because the code is too complex to uh, deal with um, static analysis of low-level code. First, make the code come closer to our ideal of saying what you, expressing directly what you want to say, rather than fiddling with, with, with uh, complicated uh, pointer and arithmetic uh, deals. It becomes untraceable untractable with um, static analysis and creates too many false positives. We have to start by raising the level of code. And uh, also, we, we, uh, we care about performance as well as type and resource safety, so the core guidelines has a, a larger domain than just safety. And um, actually, once you start following those rules and have tool support for the rules checking, productivity uh, becomes uh, significantly better. I, I've seen examples of that even though it's early days yet. So why am I not presenting to you a finished product that you can go and use? Uh, basically, it's too difficult to write source analysis and transformation software for C++ meaning that the checkers get quite expensive to, to make and quite complicated. I think we have to uh, create better frameworks for analyzing uh, C++ code. Uh, Gabby does raise and I uh, created an example of what I'm thinking about here, uh, known with the creative name IPR, uh, internal program representation. Uh, which, which uh, is an idea of how you can create a better foundation for analysis programs, because what I'm talking about here depends critically on analysis. And then, please help. Uh, developers should, should try the core guidelines, should suggest improvements. Um, it is possible to have improvements. There are ways of seeing the improvements come in. You just go to GitHub and, and make some comments. Don't expect us to be able to do everything you want or to do everything you want tomorrow. But this is a project that will last for years and we will get there eventually. And developers of analyzers are the people I'm most interested in really. 
I would like to see more support for the uh, core guidelines. I would like to see the uh, people writing analyzers aiming for complete coverage. And I would also take it for granted that they will find weaknesses in what has been documented, what has been um, presented, and they are probably the ones that are the best to uh, point out uh, weaknesses. And uh, again, remember, complete checking of arbitrary code is impossible. Um, the, um, dynamic linking, the, the halting problem, things like that. And so tracking down and marking code as being overly complex is, is a good thing. And then there's a bunch of reading here. It's not, not just arm waving. And uh, this, this was what I was going to say now. And we, I, wow, almost uh, on time, 15 minutes to a QA. and um, I suggest you, you go to the microphones uh, for, for questions. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, perhaps this is a naive question, but you say that we should tag sections of code that are overly complex. Is there any way of more formally specifying that other than just saying it's where the static analyzers fail? No. Uh, I, I have thought about that. There's actually on one of the, you know, I, there were some things that I was likely to forget to say. They're marked in red on the slides. There's one that says, uh, how clever should an analyzer be? And I do not know the, the answer to, to that question. It's, uh, it's, to me, still a question, and we have to answer it. Especially once we get more than one static analyzer, then it would be really nice if they all um, rejected code at roughly the same uh, level. And uh, for that, I think the only hope is for writers of static analyzers to stick their heads together and um, come up with, with, with some uh, suggestions. Maybe not perfect to begin with, but talk to it. And the standards committee, by the way, is a place where you can talk to uh, competitors about things like that. It's one of the reasons we have a standards committee. Uh, even though I'm not proposing this should be standardized soon, but I would like to see, for instance, the checking of the, uh, the, the, the checking of the basic stuff um, type and resource safety um, is potential for, for standardization. Thank you. Uh, I had a quick question about the, uh, the not null uh, annotation. So I like to check what I see against my sort of default go-to for a concept. And if I have a concept of a, a handle that can't be null, I would have thought by default you might use a, a reference for that. So can you comment on the distinction between those? Yes, basically, if you, if, if you use a reference, that this doesn't come into uh, the, the, the game at all. It is assumed and by the language rules to be not null. Uh, however, there is a lot of pointers floating around uh, li like uh, pointers to character arrays and things like that. And for those, you, 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 you want it to be able to be not null and to ch be able to change its value. References are simpler, deliberately simpler, uh, to overcome that problem. And if you want to deal with the fact that you can both change the value and you would like to have statement either that it's uh, not null or that we don't know if it's not null and you must check. That's what that annotation is for. Makes sense, thanks. Bjarna, for several years I've been giving advice that you've made me doubt a little bit. And it has to do with pointers that have been rendered invalid. Um, a lot of my clients will then set them to null as a way of sort of making it really clear that they're no longer yeah. holding the resource. And of course, that has issues with it. And I've been recommending null. If you're doing that, 
you're, it's inefficient. It's better just for your system to know that those pointers are null and to leave them alone. But now I'm wondering. So any clarity you can kind of shed on that? Um, I think that the idea is that you steady to declare things to be not null, and then you force a check if you are passing to a not null that it really isn't not null if you don't know it. That, that's the idea. You, you don't set things to, to, to null just, just for safety. And uh, whether that can be done without a, a sufficiently good static analysis, I think currently it is actually done in the uh, Microsoft version. I haven't checked it lately, so I might be wrong, but I think it's right that uh, you can just declare things not null, and um, they will be not null when you run your program. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's, by the way, a distinction here, what, whether we check it at runtime or statically. I prefer statically. I think currently it is done at runtime, so that you get an exception if you violate. It's the runtime situation I'm mostly you know, thinking yeah. about. Yeah. There, there was an, an interesting relationship as we were explaining like not null and all those concepts between, th there's an overlap with what you're describing and this whole discipline of symbolic execution in static analysis where we're essentially trying to narrow down like from the universe of all possible oh, yeah. values, what are the values that could actually happen here? And like there's also like an interesting overlap with where contracts are going. And, yeah. Uh, and yeah, I'm not talking about contracts. Um, that seems to be one of these inflamed topics where people can't agree on what it should do and how. So I'm not uh, banking on this. Early um, core guidelines thought that we would get contracts and recommended their use. Um, I can, can no longer uh, trust that. And symbolic education, uh, uh, symbolic evaluation is is. I think it is necessary to do what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So, and, and if you go back to some of my academic work, you'll see one of my grad students uh, got 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 work done in that area. So, yeah. uh, so one thing that you're mentioning of like the trusted annotation made me think was that there's maybe points where we need to be able because you we're essentially turning the type checker into a contract evaluator in some sort. Uh, and for some definition of contract. Yes. Uh, and, and it got me thinking, like, should we have an annotation of saying, like, I am narrowing the contract of this specific return to this other contract, or narrowing from this, like, broader type to this, like... Just now, I'm not going there. Okay. <laughs> it's uh, just too much up in the air, too contentious in the standards committee. And I don't have infinite time, so I have to concentrate <laughs> on something. I know about that kind of logic. I, 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 there are value to it, but it's not what I'm doing now. All right. If, if you want it, go design it. We, we are open to input. Thank you. Yeah, so um, it was mentioned here that like, um, we want to abandon some sometimes uh, implicit conversions and uh, also some, um, you mentioned some words about type safety and type checking. Um, and sometimes we want to abandon some implicit conversions. So we introduce like some wrappers over built-in types or over some classes. Does it make sense to introduce a new keyword like to ban all implicit conversion for some particular path? No, I don't think uh, banning all implicit conversions is feasible at the compiler level. It is would be feasible in, in a guideline that is selectively adopted. Um, I, I've been trying to get rid of those for 40 years, and so I'm not very optimistic that, it, that I can do it or if anybody can do it. Um, but I would like there to be a, an optionally choosable um, guidelines saying, please enforce no implicit narrowing conversions. And in the core guidelines, there's actually um, support for narrowing, that where you say narrow, there's one checked, there's one that checks whether it, 
that uh, could be narrowing and the other one that actually tests whether the narrowing happens and throws if it does. So there's some support about that. But in, in the language, I, I don't think we can do it. We have a few questions from online. Is there core guideline? Is the core guidelines a must follow rule or should we interpret them according to each situation? The, the, the way that we think about them is that we can't test all of the rules and there's enforcement guidelines for a lot of them, and the, the checker and the checkers test some of the guidelines. The most complete checker, the one in um, in, in, in the Visual Studio, uh, has profiles that allows you to selectively check some of the rules. Uh, but I don't think choosing individual rules makes a lot of sense because there's a conceptual framework here. Things like saying like a, a raw pointer points to a single element. If you don't have that rule, a lot of the other rules don't make sense that's related to pointers. So what, uh, what we are suggesting is that you create clusters of rules that are tested together uh, called profiles, um, and you can then enforce saying, I want the, all the checking of ranges and null pointers checked or I want to make sure there's no dangling pointers in my program. And so you can use that for gradual introduction, or if you are not interested in the whole thing for some absurd reason, uh, you, you do those. But the fundamental ones, I think, eventually we could get an agreement uh, to, to do them almost universally. Great, thanks. I have another question from online. Uh, will C++ support covariant return types with value types, especially smart pointers? Covariant return types do not work with value types such as templates, especially shared pointer of template type. So if I want to return shared pointer of type derived, that will not be covariant with, fun with function that returns shared pointer of template type T, uh, where derived extends T. Has C++ next slash present solved that? Will C++ future solve it? Um, I'm not a fan of covariant return types. And therefore, if uh, somebody wants it, they have to propose it, and they'll probably come up against my usual set of objections to, to that. And we'll see what happens. But uh, I, I'm not offering hope. Look, I'm not dictator here. I can be wrong and I can be overruled, but in this particular case, I, I wouldn't uh, offer hope. And I think we are close to finish, so maybe we should just stop. And uh, thank you very much. And think about what I said about we can use help. Thank you.